I have no idea if we can do this movie. I don't want to do it unless we can do it right and we can create the world as, as real um, as possible. This is the biggest movie I've ever attempted to make. And this story means an awful, awful lot. We needed to have a war there for six weeks with planes flying around and hundreds and hundreds of stuntmen and bombs going off. How do we do something we haven't done before? How exciting can we make it? How are you going to flip a battleship? You really felt like you were in a war. It's a movie that really hasn't been done. Good luck, guys. Zero's approaching, zero's approaching. From producer Jerry Bruckheimer and producer-director Michael Bay. Feel the concussion. Boom! We need to feel the concussion on that water blast. Comes an epic motion picture about that fateful December morning in 1941. Give me to a twig! When a nation moved into action. Starring Ben Affleck, Josh Hartnett, Kate Beckinsale, John Voight, Alec Baldwin, and Cuba Gooding Jr. Let's get ready to go, Flanker, final turn. I like the ones that go lateral. Ah! Oh, yeah! Travel behind the scenes for a special look at the making of a film of massive scope and scale. I'm just gonna make up some booms for you, all right? This will be very loud. And journey back in time to relive the drama of a day that will live in infamy. It's a story of a catastrophic defeat, heroic victory, and personal courage. There are events in a nation's history that transform it forever. There are lines in time that mark the beginnings of new eras. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The Japanese achieved complete surprise. They took control of the air by destroying the American planes that were grouped together on the ground. First thing you saw was dirt kicked up beside us. Somebody said, what's that? And somebody else said, by God, they're shooting at us. Torpedo bombers targeted the battleships, lined up in neat rows. What's going on? They said there's a mock air attack. The USS Oklahoma capsized in eight minutes with its crew inside. All hands man your battle stations. We're being attacked by the Japs. This is no drill. The USS Arizona was struck by a bomb that penetrated its ammunition magazine. 1,177 of its sailors were entombed and perished. Over 2,400 Americans lost their lives in the attack on Pearl Harbor. The character of a nation is difficult to discern until its people are put to the test. Eyewitness accounts of the attack were a key element in the development of the film's story, leading producer-director Michael Bay to interview more than 70 Pearl Harbor survivors, many of whom visited the set during production. I was just fascinated with all little teeny tidbits of heroic stories within this huge tragedy. And that's what really got me intrigued. So me and my buddy was coming out, and I went out through the hatch, and I dropped in water this deep. And I turned around, and I said, you coming white? And he said, I'll be right with you. And the hatch went shut, and he didn't get out. I saw this innocent man, and I saw his eyes start to well up. 
And I realized this man was telling me a story that he rarely tells. Something you don't forget, especially when you see thousands of men screaming, you know, mama. They were all young kids like I was, you know. They were just kids. They were screaming for their mother and father. It was staggering to hear such an amazing story. And, and it, it, it's truly a tragic story, but through this tragedy comes this amazing American power that rises from, our, from these ashes. The road traveled to get the story of Pearl Harbor from script to screen was a long and arduous one, requiring a united front on the part of the filmmakers and a deep commitment to making sure the story would be told properly. How can I take the audience into this attack? And what can I show that would represent the key things in this attack that were symbolic enough to give you the whole feeling of Pearl Harbor? I felt that the picture couldn't be made properly unless Michael could shoot at Pearl Harbor. We had intense meetings with the Pentagon, Secretary of Defense on down, and we were asking really for unprecedented military cooperation. One year prior to production, Bay and Bruckheimer created simple animation sequences to help sell the military on the idea. We worked with a satellite image of Pearl Harbor. We digitally made the battleships, digitally made planes. These are just little crude little cartoons, but these planes would actually fly. We could fly around the base. We can, we can create these huge epic shots that we did in my office with just two guys. We showed it to them along with these drawings, and Michael would work with an illustrator what he felt uh, some of the action was going to be in the movie. And I think they were overwhelmed by it, in fact. This was going to be a bigger approval, a bigger support challenge than anything else we've ever done. The Navy signed on to the project and allowed the production to film on location at the exact spot where the attack took place. Jerry's a filmmaker of great stature, and we had every confidence that this is the kind of picture that he could bring to fruition successfully and one, too, that had a higher purpose, and that is to reflect credit on the survivors of Pearl Harbor and those who did not survive Pearl Harbor. While the filmmakers strove to portray the actual events of Pearl Harbor, they also had to focus on how to bring the audience into the emotional realm of the real people who experienced it. If we make the story about getting caught up in the lives of some people, some very specific people that we care about, and the, and the, the journey of their lives, then we will capture an event. We'll have a story of humanity. If I had one more night to live, I'd want to spend it with you. And it's the people that make any event worth telling and, and lasting. The emotions of the fictional characters created for the film story are based on a combination of historical fact and eyewitness accounts of the days leading up to December 7, 1941, and of the tragic moment when the bombs first began to fall. There were so many stories. What I kept trying to do is not tell the one particular story or the two. I kept taking bits and pieces to try to give the essence of what happened. You know, the man who was on the Oklahoma on the rail that was going over, literally the entire ship is going over and he's holding on and his buddy's saying, I can't swim, I can't swim, I can't swim. I can't swim! And he falls into the water and he drowns. I'll have these things like the bomb that, sh that, that blew up the Arizona was supposedly, they feel, it was a bomb that came from a high-level bomber 10,000 feet up and uh, it went four stories down into the magazine room where the magazine room is where they stored the gunpowder for their shells. Get everything out! Go! Go! The nurses in Pearl Harbor had horrowing experiences of these young men burned and dying all around them, and they had, didn't have the medical supplies to keep up with the, the amount of casualties that were coming in. The nurses really have to just act. It's a life, obviously, life or death situation that they can make a big difference to, so they really have to store everything up and kind of panic later almost. There's too many to help, okay? You gotta sort them out. Only those that can be saved you bring in here. You got that? I can't. No, please do it. I need you to do it. Go, go. From the nurses who assisted the injured to the soldiers who faced the battle, real life eyewitness accounts were interwoven into the film's scripted story. I didn't even know the Japs were sore at us. 
the planes were low, you know, they weren't, they weren't way up there. They were below the horizon. Boy, we jumped out of that bunk. I didn't have any clothes on except my uh, skivvy shirt and shorts. I hit the deck and tried to get behind something. They were blown up and blown off the ship. The ship uh, it literally jumped up in the air. The ship would start listing and all the guys would start sliding down the other side of the ship. One had a rifle and the other had a 45 and they were shooting at this plane. We knew they were trapped and we knew that they wasn't going to make it. The bullets went right past me on both sides making splinters on the dock. A Japanese plane came over and strafed us and he hit uh, several of the airplanes. When they come in and strafe, they come in and strafe low. I would shut my eyes and I'd see those dead bodies. I'd open my eyes and in the darkness and I'd see those dead bodies. I had one hell of a time sleeping. Once in a while, I'll wake up during the night, I'll see strange things, you know, and then, then it'll come back to me towards the Pearl Harbor Sea. And uh, it's always in my memory. While eyewitness accounts of the raid heighten the film's emotional story, fact-based historical figures also appear throughout the film to provide the story with a sense of reality. We are at war. Of course there's a risk. Historical figures portrayed in the film include Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war. I still look. I said, well, it looks familiar. It's Roosevelt, but that actor. I can't quite tell who he is. It's John Boyd. Do not tell me. It can't be done. When you think of gravity with this guy, this guy didn't have legs. This guy couldn't stand. And I was, and I'm very moved by that. Dory Miller, who was a third-class mess attendant credited with shooting down several Japanese planes, is played by Cuba Gooding Jr. They made me a cook. Two years, they never even let me fire a weapon. Cooks at the time weren't allowed to um, handle any weapon, so he never had any formal training on the big guns that he was shooting. Um, 50 caliber, double barrel, machine guns, anti-aircraft machine guns, and he just jumped on it and did it. Colonel James Doolittle, who was an innovative Army Air Corps pilot, is played by Alec Baldwin. The mission I'm asking you to volunteer for is exceptionally dangerous. Take a look at the man beside you. It's a good bet that in the next six weeks, you or he will be dead. The thing you need to be true to when you do an historical drama is the idea or ideas that the lives of these people represent. And Doolittle is somebody who you can't make him more heroic than he was. Victory belongs to those that believe in it the most, and believe in it the longest. We're gonna believe. We're gonna make America believe too. Here we go, ready, ready? Even the characters portrayed by Ben Affleck and Josh Hartnett are an amalgam of real people woven into the fictional story of two friends from Tennessee who go into battle side by side. Just make sure and come back for the both of us, all right? My character, for example, is representative of everything that happens to me happened to somebody in the war. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, two men named Welsh and Taylor actually did manage to get airborne. And although hopelessly outnumbered, they shot down six enemy aircraft. Let's do it! Oh! There was such idealism and hope and kind of youthfulness and kind of naivete, it seems to me. And it was all shattered in one awful, tremendous morning. And it's literally waking up on a beautiful Sunday morning and then entering hell. of K.
characters defined and the focus of the epic story in place, the filmmakers were left with the logistical task of pulling together the resources for the production and recreating a battle of massive scope and scale. Only you guys will make sure the military looks like they're military. We need your help on that. There's a period feel to the Pearl Harbor, and that's the hardest thing to create. Then there was the whole hardware issue. Can I create Battleship Pro? These are battleships that do not exist anymore. On a scouting trip at Pearl Harbor, Bay looked out the plane and noticed a group of ships. And I'm like, what are all those ships doing there? Some of the ships turned out to be part of the Navy's inactive fleet. I was wondering, well, these ships could supplement for some of the stuff we were doing, because we needed ships that we can really rip apart and put gigantic explosions on. This will look good, right? Handheld, I mean, a camera right here. After the production was satisfied that the Navy ships would not be damaged, they became a part of the set for the film. When Michael Bay came aboard, I think, he felt that we were really pulling out all the stops for him, and he was right. I mean, we really allowed him to, to kind of dictate on the set, you know, what, what he wanted, what his vision was. Location scouts scoured the world in search of World War II era ships and hardware. Right, here we go, ready, ready. Scenes would be shot on museum ships and an active aircraft carrier. The word went out to owners and pilots of World War II vintage aircraft. And soon a small air force of period planes was being shrink wrapped in plastic and loaded onto an ocean going barge. The costume designer went to work immediately to create from scratch 8,000 authentic World War II uniforms and to gather period clothing from around the world. Women today are a lot bigger than they used to be and a lot of the women who were cast were models and they'd be six feet tall and wear a size 10 or 11 shoe. It was a nightmare. I mean, that was probably the biggest challenge. Every detail was scrupulously considered. Alec Baldwin was sent to officer's training school. Human stack. Climb up this wall, one over the other, get to the top, then we're going to feed the barrel up the side, then we're going to pull each other one by one over that way. And the other male members of the cast were given an opportunity to bond. They put us through four days of Ranger boot camp, which is really tough boot camp. It was easily the most grueling and difficult physical experience, in some ways psychological experience, I've ever had to go through. Now, do you understand? Yes, Sergeant, or no, Sergeant? No, you don't. You don't understand. Our poor actors were submitted to some of the harshest stuff. Come on, Walker, on the way, come on! It left me with a real sense of achievement after having finished it, and it left me with a, it left me with an enduring respect for what the men and women of the United States military go through. Ready and action. The overall picture of what happened at Pearl Harbor is fairly clear, but the visceral story unfolds only when told through the eyes of the people who were there. And I'm telling you, it scared the living daylights out of me. It, 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 it was fear that I had never ever in my life felt before. I have never known fear like that in my whole life when I saw the Arizona explode. The only way to tell the story that Bay and Bruckheimer wanted to tell was to recreate the event as it happened and put the characters and the cameras in the middle of the action. We were trying to ask them to do something that's never been done before in film. Get ready, now, now! One of the most complicated challenges was to capture the scene of the battleship Oklahoma capsizing. And it would be great if a couple stupid could launch right by the anchor, you know what I mean? Like slide in and grab the rail, okay? The thing is, how are you going to flip a battleship? How are you going to turn it over? And we built 
built the world's largest gimbal. It's like 180 foot in front of a battleship that rolls over. It's 350,000 pounds of steel. We have over 100 stuntmen falling off, and then the thing comes on top of them in the water. And that might only be a minute in the movie, but um, it makes a realism for that one minute. So visceral. And when you see the sequence in the film, you won't believe it. You won't believe it's real. And it is real. He's actually rolling that ship over. Special effects supervisor John Frazier was in charge of creating the explosions. For Michael to go out and say, we're gonna, we're gonna blow up real ships. I mean, every other movie that's ever been made would not even consider that. It'd be a model. You have to do so much research on, on what happened and what these explosions look like. We did one six ship explosion that was rigged for over a month and a half. We used um, 700 sticks of dynamite and we used 2,000 feet of primer cord and 4,000 gallons of gasoline. Uh, yes, we have resistance. In the special effects world, when we say we blew up something, well, it's simulated. We strategically place charges. They are high explosive charges, but the way we place these charges, they do no harm to the ships. Three, two, one! Once the explosives were rigged, Stunt coordinator Kenny Bates had to place hundreds of people in the middle of them. How are we going to put these, you know, 250, 300 people in these sequences? We have, a, you know, anywhere between 50 and 100 stunt people and hundreds of extras. But the extras were no ordinary group of people. The extras that we had were all military and they were excellent definitely contributed to the picture. With real soldiers, sailors, Marines, and National Guardsmen as the background actors, a core group of stuntmen performed the major stunts. It was just bodies raining down from the air, just falling one after another after another. And we did these sequences. We'd shoot them three, four, five, six times. And every once in a while, Michael might say, give me five guys on fire. You know, I want yeah. some guys on fire. How yeah. many guys are going to be on fire? What do we have? I think six to eight. If they were 50 feet in the air, they had to get lit up wait about 10 seconds till the flames grew up, you know, to a nice burning orange flame. You know, then it was action. And action. The next essential element for filming the attack sequences was the Japanese fighter and bomber airplanes. Alan Perwin was the aerial coordinator. We had 16 airplanes in Hawaii. We had four P-40s. Uh, we had three Zeros. We had three Kates, three Vals. We had a T-28 airplane as a camera platform, a B-25 as a camera platform, and a helicopter as a camera platform. Steve Hinton was the chief pilot. What can you do? What do you think, you know? How low can we get? You know, how exciting can we make it? Yeah. Yeah. Communication is, is everything. You can't maintain a safe operation unless you can talk and everybody knows exactly what's going on. These were flying very fast and very close to each other. There were over 350 separate bombs that had to be detonated within seven seconds with planes flying by a few seconds before. The idea was everybody would kind of converse right when, right when it would go off. And my God, it really did it. It was amazing. Flying along and seeing, you know, go right by. Holy smoke, look at that, you know, that was very, really impressive. And the effects guys who put it all together, they really were right on. They went between buildings, they uh, were skimming the water, they were dive bombing. You name it, these, these pilots did it. Pretty good. Cut, do it another one like that. Cutting, cutting. Property master Charles Stewart constructed dummy torpedoes to be dropped from the planes. I don't know what's going to happen to that torpedo when it hits the water. I don't know if it's going to fall at the right angle because we haven't done it. I mean, we had to test two torpedoes when we got over there. I hope these torpedoes don't break. 
found out that we needed to change the weight distribution a little bit. They need to be weighted a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. A little top heavy. Uh, but let's get a day camera right here on sticks, okay? When we were doing big shots, we would do 10 or 11 cameras. Wow, 75's pretty good. Five of them would be operated. What if you try a 40? And then the rest would be small little IMOs that we place to get stuff on the ground. There's going to be a VistaVision camera and a Forper camera. One camera looking across extras. And then number eight is our plate shot here on the crane. That's pretty good, too. Director of photography John Swartzman kept the cameras in the middle of the action. We designed the explosion so that the cameras could run in amongst the stuntmen. I mean, sometimes the stuntmen were literally there as like bodyguards for the camera guys so that if something went off, they would sort of intercept it before the camera got hit. There might be a few shots in the movie if you look very closely. He's our underwater cameraman. And he's dressed up like a Navy sailor with a little camera you barely see. Let's get some air protection in. It's going to be very, very loud. Air protection for all my friends, please. First assistant director Casey Hodenfield was like a stage manager in charge of coordinating the logistics of a shot. Ready and action! For every shot, you have to discuss what is happening, what sequence is happening, how things are going to be. Uh, blowing up in what order. The first debris bomb is behind those two stacked green boxes there. It goes, fire goes on the deck up here where nobody is, and two water bombs go right on either side of the bow. Um, how loud? How loud is it, Jim? Earplugs, please, earplugs. How big? Let's have the whole Air Force fly over. That's per Michael Bay. Where a safe zone is. Do not run behind 23. 35 gallons of gasoline is going to blow up. The wings are rigged with primer cord. And basically, the sixth plane has 15 gallons of gas, and it's on a bomb. Where, you know, where people can be, where operator cameras can be. Everybody's supposed to be running this way. At, at these cameras and away from the helicopter, OK? You see it, you'll say, now, is this all real? Did these guys really go out and do this? We did. We went out and did it. With explosives rigged, fighter planes in the air, cameras in place, and actors, stuntmen, and extras at the ready, some of the most complex battle scenes ever filmed were choreographed from central posts. We are locking up the freeway. The boats are high. Steve, uh, David is requesting you be number 2-0 with camera Roger. Adventure number 2, I uh, will. We have a 38-hit nail board. And helicopter's coming back in uh, for a gun jam. All right, when the big water hit comes here. Three, two, one, go. Ba -ba 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 Boom, guys, you're in the air. Yes, it's Hollywood, but that's real fire. That's real flame. It was the first time I'd actually seen a 300-foot wide fireball coming right at me. Blew it up right behind us, and we're running away from it. It literally knocked us down. I personally flew aircraft and did maneuvers. I mean, I did rolls, loops, hammerheads, low altitude flying. I mean, it was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, stuff it. More glass, the better. We had to have a P-40 come by the tower, and that plane was, I would say, about 11 feet from our tower, coming at 250 miles an hour. If that's not a rush, I don't know what is. This is as good as it gets for an act. You're actually in Pearl Harbor, and there are actual zeros coming out of you. Know what I mean? It's awesome. The logistics of filming the attack on Pearl Harbor required hundreds of dedicated cast and crew members. However, to heighten and enhance the scope and scale of the film's massive battle scenes, 
the filmmakers needed to look beyond the physical resources they had put in place and step into the world of new computer technology. I literally had nine planes to create an Air Force of 350. We started with the real ships blowing up, the real planes coming in, uh, and enhanced it with uh, digital effects. I realized there was no way to really do this movie until now because of the digital world. And I chose ILM because of their sheer computer power, which is second to the US military. Go! It was the job of industrial light and magic to make a few replica planes fill the sky, to turn a few decommissioned ships into the mighty US Pacific fleet, and to transform the detailed accounts of what happened into a vibrant visual narrative. ILM's Eric Brevig was the visual effects supervisor and second unit director. In Pearl Harbor, you're in a major attack for 45 minutes. It doesn't let up. It's completely believable and it surrounds you. It's very intense. We can put images on screen that are either too expensive or too unsafe to, to try to attempt in front of a camera. We'll film it without the people there, and then we will composite real actors into the scene or synthetic people, um, make it look like they were all in harm's way. Before any detailed effects could be created, ILM had to turn the visual clock of Pearl Harbor back 60 years and erase the modern buildings that lined the shore. We have to paint out everything practically that's there except maybe the distant mountains and start layering in uh, synthetic battleships, uh, attacking planes, giant explosions, um, uh, all the stuff that was needed for the, the attack sequence. So we would build a computer-generated model uh, of a boat or an airplane, and we would duplicate it, uh, in, the, in the case of the planes, hundreds of times, in the case of the boats, dozens of ships, so that we could really fill out the entire harbor. And that's something you couldn't do any other way. Sometimes it's my job to run over to the cameraman and say, no, you've got a frame over there to the right where there's nothing because we're going to put in five more planes blowing up. Okay. Let's just back up five feet. Like five feet. Yeah. You've got to shoot a background plate of sort of flying down Battleship Row, and obviously there's no battleships there, there's no smoke, there's no fire. And then you look at that and think, well, now I've got to put the rest of the war in here. You know? and, and that's sort of the challenge. We want to digitize stuff back there. I understand. OK, save it, Tom. Continue this route, and then we'll make another row. About 50 planes. About 50 planes. We're going to add in 50 planes. The shots are all so complex that we have to have a team of, um, you know, six people sometimes on the bigger shots. You know, someone will be animating the plane, someone will be working on the water and the boats, someone on the smoke, someone on the bullets and the strafing that the planes are firing. Then there's someone integrating all that. To enhance scenes involving large-scale explosions and numerous background actors, ILM was called upon to build a computerized library of interchangeable animated human characters. There's humans, there's sailors all over these things, and they're being, you know, sucked under and they're trapped inside. So we had to make sure that we were able to populate our miniature and computer graphics with People. These animated characters were brought to life by programming them with data that came from filming the movement of real people in the ILM studios. Motion capture allows us to capture the movements of a real actor and apply them to our computer graphics characters. We have them dressed in suits with markers on them so that multiple cameras can track them very easily and create animation data from that easily. It looks like a real person because originally it was a real person. So this is the uh, battleship Arizona, and this is the scene when the bomb explodes. In the footage, you see this smoke coming out of the chimney first, and a lot of people thought that the bomb went down the chimney first. Um, but that's just the internal structure, you know, exploding and pushing that soot through the chimney. For the shot in which the Arizona blows up, we filmed uh, modern ships that are in Pearl Harbor today, and then using the water and the framing, put in a computer-generated version of the Arizona with uh, a massive explosion with people being blown into the air. Start the ship rolling, please. Start the ship rolling. 
To create the shot of the Oklahoma capsizing, the filmmakers first filmed live action shots of the huge gimbal rotating with stuntmen clinging on. Then ILM did the rest. We filmed that it, with visual effects cameras as though there was an entire ship continued on the back of it. And then in post-production, modeled the rest of the ship and tracked it frame by frame to this little nose piece and put another 150 CG sailors continuing the, the population of the ship going back. And this whole thing turns over, splashes down into the water. All this stuff is added in into one sort of amazingly big shot. It's just a question of sort of memory for computers, I think, is what really what it is as they get as they get faster and you just can do more. The first year of the war, they were kicking our tails, at least the first six months. And they had thoroughly intended to conquer the United States. There was no doubt about it. That's the first time I ever had anybody shooting at me with intent to kill. And so that made me a little bit angry, and uh, I decided that, well, by golly, we'll just whip them. We did. Does anyone in this room think that victory is possible without facing danger? We are at war. Following the sudden attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States put into motion a top secret mission to seek retribution against the Japanese. Mr. President, I think we have an idea about how to bomb the Japanese. Fire away, gentlemen. Lieutenant Colonel James H. Doolittle was assigned the task of assembling a team of volunteer pilots willing to accept a nearly impossible mission to attempt a bombing raid on Tokyo using Army B-25s launched from a Navy aircraft carrier. And Doolittle himself, uh, I think, wasn't sure that the mission was gonna work. It was a real suicide mission. Chances are no hope of coming back. No one had ever launched an Army bomber from an aircraft carrier before or since. So it was quite dicey for the Navy as well as for the Army. The filmmakers took on the challenge of recreating the courageous Doolittle raid down to the last detail including their own sea-based launch from an aircraft carrier. When you're on a real carrier, you're out in that breeze and they turn that thing around and you got the, you're going into the wind as they're trying to take off. It's exciting. Whenever film companies come to the Navy and they ask us to actually film out on a carrier, that bar none is probably the greatest challenge. We have an operational flight schedule that happens daily, so they are pretty much playing in our sandbox. They have to go with our rules, our regulations. And the guy took us around the flight deck and he says, this little two-inch line right here that runs the length of the carrier is the line of death. Do not pass this line. Well, our cameras were four feet on the other side of the line of death. Ten feet away, there were F-18s landing every minute. You're set to go? Okay, you're good to go. The Navy gave the production only a three-hour window to get their shots, but fog closed in on the carrier. The captain of the ship ordered his crew to scan the weather radar and search the ocean for a patch of sunlight. Indicate 94 RPM. Meanwhile, you see this carrier around the sea going like this, and he found this 20 mile hole of sun. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I said to the guy, I said, can we slow this carrier down? And he goes, yeah. And I said, all right, slow it down. Literally 30 seconds later, this gigantic $6 billion ship slows down. With time running out, the planes were lined up and ready to launch. During 
the production, survivors of the Doolittle Raid were invited to visit the set. We were told that we were going to bomb Tokyo, so we all were going to make the first retaliatory strike against Japan. Our aircraft was the first one off the deck. We didn't know if we had enough gas to make the coast, so we climbed up to 9,000 feet. We're in the enemy's backyard! Bombs away! Bombs away! And flew until we ran out of gas and everybody bailed out. Of the 80 volunteers who made up the Doolittle Raiders, 67 managed to make it back home. Doolittle came home believing he'd failed, and he got home when they gave him the Medal of Honor. What the United States is defined by today is the direct result of the actions that were taken by Doolittle and, and everybody else that was a part of the effort after the attack on Hawaii. I was really honored to be allowed on the U.S. hollowed ground to, to do this movie. It's just, it's, it was eerie sometimes to be sitting where the first bomb dropped during the attack. All of a sudden I thought, oh my God, I'm standing in a place where, you know, where this event actually happened. And then it became very profound for me. You have the people who are there to whom this, this event has a very personal relevance and meaning. They're actually very everyday, ordinary folk who did really extraordinary things when confronted with that level of challenge. They, they've gone through something that I don't ever want to go through, you know. They always say, remember Pearl Harbor. All these survivors say, we want people to remember Pearl Harbor. Perhaps the most poignant reminder of the battle that took place at Pearl Harbor is the sunken remains of the battleship Arizona. Oil from its fuel tanks still seeps to the surface. It has become a memorial to the men entombed inside. This image just came to me that we got to be able to see that ship. It would be so great to see the real ship as it is today. So we asked the, the National Park Service, and they felt that this would do something for the monument and keeping the memory of it. You go into the water, and it's very murky under there. And then all of a sudden, you come upon this huge mass, and there's barnacles all over it. Then you see a porthole, and the glass is still in the porthole. In the front of that ship, there's still three guns sitting there. Quite an experience to go down there. It kind of brings a, a silence over everything that you're doing and makes it much more meaningful. And we had an experience where we did a dedication at the Arizona and uh, we played taps. You're standing there and there are 1,100 men entombed in the Arizona and they're still there. It brings tears to your eyes uh, and the sacrifices that our armed services made to protect our freedom and that's what you, you feel at Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor survivors and guests will now take a flower and place it into the waters of Pearl Harbor. My division alone lost almost 30 people. And uh, most of them were good friends of mine. A lot of them died in the water and, and, and sank. Everybody in that aircraft, in that mess hall, were killed, you know, that morning. Finley and Jones. I went to the boot camp with in sea school. I think we were killed that morning. It's hard when you know someone real personally to go through boot camp and all of that. It's a movie that ultimately gives you a, a great surge of emotion. You learn something about that day. You learn the characters of those people. 
they were. They were so committed to America and doing the right thing for the country and putting their country ahead of their lives. And it was amazing how the country pulled together. Well, it's a seminal event in our history. Pearl Harbor stands out as one of America's biggest tragedies and turned into its biggest triumphs. In a way, it's about a loss of innocence for the United States. I came to recognize that this was this hugely important moment in American history. And ultimately, this is a movie that people can watch and get emotionally involved in. But it does show the fighting spirit and the, the awareness on the part of the people who are there. I think these sorts of movies, what you take away from them is a larger understanding of things that happened in the world, sacrifices people made. This is a movie to honor these volunteers and veterans. And I think that's one of the themes of the movie, is that the heart of the volunteers what won the war for us, and the men who wanted to protect their country and their homes.